Um, hi, uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I'm Steve Hines and I live in Cumberland. For over six years, I have coordinated stream surveys and habitat improvement projects for Sebago chapter of Trout Unlimited in southwestern Maine. It's easy to find volunteers to help Mainers value the quality of our waters. I submitted testimony last year that asked that the rules be strengthened in a number of ways. Since the mining rules have resurfaced as LD-146, there have been meetings by the ENR committee. I have watched some of them on YouTube. I am a retired Navy commander, and I respect the process, but I, I have, uh, but I found one of the, 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 ses of the sessions particularly disturbing. Representative Foley, former chair of MB MBEP, said in essence that the, that the months the board spent wrestling with the metallic mining rules were not adequate for them to figure out how to f fix them. And the fixes needed to include define the mining area, deal with the issue of perpetual treatment, and strengthening the rules <coughs> that so many of the main public had demanded. I think that uh, he hit upon a very key point. If there is a chance that a project will result in the need for perpetual treatment, then it never, never should have been permitted in the first place. LD-146 does not do this, and until someone figures out a way to do it, the rules should continue to be voted down. Rereading the rules, I'm left with the impression that perpetual treatment is not just a possible outcome, it's a likely one. Another committee session deal with monitoring wells, something that Representative Martin seems to put a great deal of stock in. By the time monitoring wells find that there is pollution present, it is already too late. The pollutants are in the groundwater and they're leaching into the soils. The areas near our volcanic sulfide deposits tend to be naturally high in, with arsenic and acidic uh, soils. And there are extremely high uh, arsenic levels in at least one potential mining site at Bald Mountain. They're so high that J.S. Cummings, the geologist who discovered the deposit, warned that there could be a debacle because of the very high uh, arsenic levels. Uh, what caveats are associated with the other potential volcanic sulfide mining sites? I, I don't think we know them all, but, but I assume since they're similar deposits, there would be others. Uh, volcanic sulfides are some of the most toxic deposits on this planet. Maine is not a mining state. Our nearby Callahan, Callahan Mine Superfund sites continues to demonstrate how wrong things can go. Despite the best assurances of the mining industry that continues to drive this legislation, the modern technology can still fail as was demonstrated by the Mount Polly Mine spill in Canada in 2014 and by coal-related spills in West Virginia in this country. <laughs> These were both in areas where mining operations have been conducted for years. How can Maine expect to get it right? Given the extremely toxic nature of the deposits and their location in some of our most pristine wilderness areas, do we really want to take the risk? South Portland took a strong stand against pumping tar sands through their city. The environmental consequences of even a significant spill there would have paled if contrasted with the possible bad outcomes associated with open pit mining of volcanic sulfide deposits upstate. More Superfund sites would be a sad legacy for the 127th legislature. So please oppose the rules as they're written. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. David Kirsten. And those of you that were in the overflow room, I'm um, to remind you, your coats and bags are still there. <laughs> I took the money out when I went for a break. So if you get home and it's not there, you'll know why. I got my wallet out of here. Oh, darn. I knew yours. I missed it. David. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm David Kirstein, resident of Scarborough and membership chairperson of the Sebago chapter of Trout Unlimited. The chapter serves approximately 600 dues-paying members in the region extending from Yarmouth southward to the New Hampshire border. Our members fish throughout the state, and I join many of our members who regularly participate in conservation projects funded by the chapter and designed to improve water quality and fishing opportunities. I also oppose LD-146. Naturally occurring volcanic sulfides and arsenic, being potential contaminants of ground and surface waters, uh, can be ex uh, their exposure in the course of mining can only make the potential for contamination greater. I think Maine's mining regulations should be strengthened 
and uh, LD146 does not appear to do that. Many people have mentioned arsenic uh, as a potential contaminant, and arsenic is unfortunately uh, a contaminant found in a significant percentage of Maine's private water wells, and it's found in levels that exceed the federal exposure limits for drinking water, so arsenic is a serious contaminant. Uh, toxicologists at the University of Southern Maine and elsewhere uh, have studied wild animal populations and <coughs> find that DNA damage is caused routinely by exposure to heavy metals in the environments those animals live in, whether it's in water or land. Uh, so both of these kinds of contamination uh, pose serious health risks. Uh, many of us speaking today have said much of the, have repeated many of the same things, so in the interest of time, I can think of no better way to express my views than to endorse those that uh, Senator Chris Johnson made this morning, and those views met with significant applause in the overflow room this morning. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I'm sorry, we have a question. Representative Campbell. Yes, thank you. Um, looking at your um, uh, first point, uh, the current rules allow unlimited groundwater contamination. Could you explain that, unlimited groundwater um, contamination? No, I cannot. Simple answer. So why is it in your testimony? Well, um, the impression and the uh, materials that I've read indicate that groundwater contamination flows from surface water contamination. and. Uh, in my, my layman's understanding, it seems that those two can be interrelated. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Don Abbott, then Chris Sewell, Christopher Sewell, Dan Daniel Harris, Christine, Dave Wood, and Peter Kalin, Diane, Bill, and who's the lady in the back? I forgot somebody, Didn't, or the gentleman in the back. What's your name? Dennis Chinoy. Dennis Chinoy. Thank you. Ready? Yes, I was a little uh, late getting here because the snow on the mid coast was uh, phenomenal. You're lucky you weren't on I-95. There was a 45, 45 I, yard. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. We're well, glad you're here. Beautiful. You. And and I did get a, uh, a copy of, of my remarks in earlier. Okay. Very good. Uh, but I'm not Go sure where they are. Okay. They'll, they'll be with us on our packages. All right. Senator uh, Saviello and, and Representative Welch and members of the Joint Standing Committee. Uh, my name is Don Abbott. I live in Camden, and I am testifying on uh, behalf of myself on uh, opposing uh, uh, 146 the way it's uh, currently structured. Uh, unlike a lot of others, I'm a retired executive from the chemical industry, and I worked uh, in a major titanium dioxide pigment manufacturing company. One of my responsibilities was to buy the ore that we used to make uh, the titanium. And so I know quite a bit about uh, titanium mining. And I've visited many of the mines around the world, uh, including Canadian mines, uh, numerous Australian mines, a South African mine, and even <clears throat> a, a mine that was active in Sierra Leone. That was an adventure, I'll tell you. The chemical industry is, in fact, very conscientious about environmental responsibility, and that carries through uh, to its suppliers of uh, raw materials, in, and especially uh, titanium ore. Uh, and the mining companies, therefore, reflect that responsibility <coughs> and are quite uh, responsible and, in fact, take great pride uh, in their post-mining post restoration process. Titanium mines are huge dug pits filled with water on which a large dredge floats and works to get out the, the, the ore. Before a pit is dug, the area is carefully surveyed, overburden is set aside, plant material is saved, including seeds. And, the, and um, once the dredge has moved through and gotten the, the, the titanium ore out, the area uh, then is carefully restored to its original contours and, and uh, overburden is spread over that. The seeds are planted. 
temporary irrigation is put in, and, and even new trees are planted. The cost of that restoration is included in the cost of the ore. I can tell you I paid for the ore. So, so the cost of that responsibility is in that ore. And uh, as a result, that cost is passed on to the pigment that we manufactured. And that cost is in the, in the cost of a can of paint. So the next time when you paint a room, this yellow paint is really titanium dioxide. The next time you paint a room, please remember that even in remote places and in third world countries, uh, my apologies to the Canadians, um, <laughs> we have in fact incurred the cost of full economic uh, environmental responsibility and you are sharing in that by paying for that can of paint. So I urge you to consider that responsible restoration of mining sites at closure must be a condition for the privilege of mining our natural materials. Water quality issues involved in metallic mining also must be addressed <clears throat> for the life of the mine and for the future generation after the mine is exhausted so that no future contamination will occur. The cost of protecting our water supply, our water quality, and restoration of the site must be part of the cost of the materials that come out of that mine. Sadly, not all mining concerns are as responsible as the titanium miners have been. Our laws need to then reflect this imperative so that our children and their children can enjoy the wonderful outdoor resources that we have. Thank you. Questions? Representative Welsh. And I'm happy to have one of my constituents here. So it's good to see you. So how does, um, if, if that cost is built into the ore itself, how does the how do market prices then affect how that works? Well, market prices, there's, there are very few actual titanium dioxide manufacturers in the world. <clears throat> and uh, market prices uh, represent basically the cost. And, and people won't take, you, they take capacity out of the system if, if the cost doesn't justify that. So obsolete plants, which are not as efficient as newer plants, then are taken out, and then that reduces the supply a little bit, and then, you know, then the price goes up a little bit. Um, I think, you know, the cost of that restoration is is not a, a, a an idea, an absolute thing. It's it's jobs. You know, it, it takes work to restore the place, and 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 so those jobs are, are an important part of the overall cost of of that mineral, titanium. Yeah. Represent Senator Breen and then Representative Campbell. Thank you. Hi. Um, Senator Martin. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, how did the titanium <coughs> mining and processing industry come to adopt this, uh, what you've claimed, what you have presented to us? It seems like a, it's a remarkably more um, responsible, uh, ecologically sound sort of um, cycle that you've that you perpetuate. In I think there are probably two two things. One, the chemical industry uh, is um, <clears throat> is is pretty responsible, and and I can tell you I've spent a lot of time in the chemical industry worrying about uh, uh, protection of the environment, pollution. Uh, waste management and, and those kinds of things. So, and they enforce they force that onto their suppliers. The second thing is is that uh, titanium mining is <clears throat> a little less uh, uh, dangerous than than the metal mining we're talking about here. Um, the uh, titanium uh, is is a very inert chemical metal. That's why we use it for joints and other things. It, it's okay in our bodies, uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, so so you don't have that problem. The the one really big problem that they have is is uh, radioactivity, and they deal with that very well. And, <coughs> and that's that's the and and that's one that that gets scary pretty fast. And and uh, uh, but but the, but they're pretty responsible there. And so I think it's, it's, it's not really legal. I mean, you, you can go to South Africa, and I can tell you the, 
mining laws in South Africa let you pretty much do what you want. <clears throat> but 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 they are and they, they take a lot of pride in 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 that restoration. And it's fantastic. Representative yes. Campbell and then Representative Martin. Thank you. I guess maybe a little bit follow up on that. Uh, maybe it's not the time titanium uh, mining, but in your worldwide travels. Um, do you have you seen examples of uh, well-managed mines, mines that work? We hear a lot about those that don't, uh, and is the technologies that uh, have progressed beyond the non-regulated that we hear a lot about to the regulated that's not working well? You know, I, I really was in titanium mines, and 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 those work pretty well, uh, and and you know there's a lot, and and in some countries there is more regulation. Uh, this country for one, and the DuPont company wanted to mine a tremendous deposit, very uh, high quality deposit, uh, down on the uh, border of uh, Georgia and Florida, and they wouldn't let them do it because they were going to be disturbing the, the, uh, the land down there. So, so they were, and, and let me tell you, when the DuPont company wants to put some resources behind it, Irving doesn't come close, you know. <laughs> and, and but but they were turned down because of <clears throat> because of, of of you know the the the, the way that they were going to get that 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 uh, that ore out. Uh, so so that was that was okay. Representative Martin. Thank you very much. I, I don't know how long Martin, <laughs> new guy. New guy. <laughs> I I just don't know how long you've lived in Maine, but I know if you remember. Uh, I served as chair of the Natural Resources Committee when the industry, your industry, opposed uh, the DEP rules on trying to deal with paint and the distribution and the placing of getting rid of, of the paint containers and making sure that they didn't end up in the, in the landfills. I don't know if you recall that and the opposition that the industry came uh, full barrel against the committee. I, 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 I don't remember that. I, I, you know, I, I've been here my entire life. Uh, but in the summer, and <laughs> I live here now. But and and, and, and you know, I, I uh, uh, you know, the industry, uh, you know, has their their thing, you know, and they're they're trying to make a profit. So of course they're going to argue that, and and it's up to it's up to uh, the state to to push back on these things. Oh, you, you make know? the point. I think, that, and that's accurate. I think our rules, the the job we have is to adopt rules which save and protect the state. Sure. And I don't think there's anyone in this committee that has desire, uh, any desire but to do that. Right. And I want to make clear that your comment was not appreciated in the paper. No. Okay. Oh, I didn't know what you said in the paper, but I do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, the uh, newspaper, um, titan geez, titanium, uh, I had some experience using in the paper industry side, but you made a very interesting comment to me. Oh, by the way, Senator, we, or Representative Martin, we, we got that passed a couple of years ago on the paint recycling. but. Question, you made a comment about South Africa. Now, we all in this room have gold rings on. What kind of restrictions do you know about the South African and gold? Well, a lot have gold someplace, or they have copper in their Prius, or they have, where, what kind of regulations, you, you alluded to that. I don't know whether you yeah, can. I, I don't know exactly what the regulations are, but I, they have been a lot looser than they are. They have been here, uh, frankly. Uh, Corporation, the corporations, the big mining corporations in, in 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 South Africa are much larger relative to the size of the country than any mining company is to the size of uh, this country. You know, okay. It's they they have a lot more power. Thank you. Which is not necessarily good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions. Very good. Very good you testimony. Yeah. Next. Okay. Uh, who we got? I got my glasses off. Uh, Christopher Sewell. Yep. Yep. Hello, thank you. Um, thank this you. is my third time, I think, testifying before the committee. I'll try to keep it brief. Much has been said already. My name is Christopher Sewell. I live in Phippsburg, Maine. 
Um, I moved back to my home state of Maine in 2005 after spending 12 years in northeastern Nevada working for a tribal nonprofit of the Western Shoshone Nation. Um, my work there, I have a, uh, a background in anthropology and natural resource policy. Um, my work for the Western Shoshone uh, involved uh, watchdogging um, mining industry impacts on traditional lands in northeastern Nevada. Um, so through those 12 years in Nevada, um, I had the opportunity to be on site tour uh, over half a dozen of the largest hard rock mines in the country, uh, filed comments on um, many more, also had the opportunity to speak with community members from almost every continent on the planet, uh, not including Antarctica, um, involved with dealing with mining impact issues. Um, the biggest one primarily is water, maintenance of water quality, both surface and groundwater quality. Um, and I worry that the proposed regulations do not do enough to protect um, water quality, especially groundwater quality, um, underneath uh, mine sites. Um, since returning home to Maine, um, I've been involved in family businesses, uh, businesses my grandfather started over 60 years ago, um, involved in um, the tourism industry uh, with a family campground. Um, involved in the lobster industry with lobster pound, lobster buying station. And over the past four years, I've been um, attempting to start a new business as an aquaculturist and oyster grower on um, Casco Bay. So I have an experience in both um, looking at the particular impacts of hard rock mining, but also my experience in the last uh, 10 years since returning home is uh, being involved in family business, being involved in the business community here in Maine. Um, I see Having participated in these last 10 years in um, many meetings, uh, both sponsored by state government and private industry, as well as the university system, um, is that there are strong efforts here um, promoted by both the state government of Maine as well as by uh, private industry uh, promoting branding of Maine products. And that's occurring in multiple industries right now. It's occurring in the lobster industry, um, promotion of Maine lobster, and a major part of that promotion is the environmental quality of Maine. Uh, we see similar things happening uh, with food and agriculture here in Maine, and aquaculture, again, strong effort at branding, promoting the environmental quality of Maine. And of course, tourism, you know, that has always been, uh, the environmental quality always been uh, what draws people to Maine here. So um, on one hand, we have um, a state government very much promoting this branding, promoting Maine um, as a pinnacle of environmental quality. Um, and then we have these mining regulations, um, which threaten to um, you do a lot to undermine um, that image and that brand of environmental quality. Specifically, can this you, idea can, of mine area, okay. mine area, the idea that we can allow contamination of groundwater underneath the mine site is an incredibly bad idea. Water is a public resource belonging to all of us, regardless of who owns the surface. So the idea that we could allow water contamination under a private mine site um, is, is a very, very <laughs> bad idea, and I would strongly suggest that the committee implement strong groundwater quality protection standards. One more thing, equality before the law. Um, I think it's improper that a landowner that owns thousands of acres could conceivably develop a project, a mining area that it defines within its property, um, contaminate the groundwater, and say, well, it hasn't left the barriers of our property, it hasn't left the mine site. Whereas somebody with, say, 10 acres, um, you know, would not have that ability to create a buffer, or create a mine site. So I think the legislature is best at putting a strong rule up front, protecting the groundwater, and then let the industry, which has always claimed now that it can perform in an environmentally responsible manner, let the industry prove and meet those strong standards protecting the water quality. Thank That's you. all I'll say Thank now. You. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, Dan Harris. It's not Dan. Excuse me. <laughs> we know that. I'm not Dan. I Dan just... Harris. Nope. He might be in the overflow. No, there's nobody in the flow overflow, Peter. I just checked. If he's there, head over. Christine. Hey everybody. Hi. Um, <laughs> I, um, I just want to make a couple of points. I'm strongly in opposition to um, LD 146. Um, and I first want to make the point um, 
about just how my understanding of how government works, um, which is that um, my understanding is that we live in a democratic, um, a representative democratic um, majority rules um, society here. And so my understanding is that if you are hearing overwhelmingly that people are in an opposition to this bill, way more, like the majority is way more in opposition to this, then it's your obligation to also oppose this bill. Um, and that's just like pretty straightforward. Um, so um, I'm an educator. I've been doing uh, political education work. Um, I'm young, so for the last you know five years. Um, and um, the collective that I work with um, does a lot of education around mountaintop removal strip mining. Um, so part of my education has been to go to Appalachia, to West Virginia in particular, and to, um, and to observe um, strip mining sites. Um, and what I'm seeing there is complete devastation of ecosystems, and people are just dying, to be frank. Like, they are just dying. Their water is poisoned. They, they can't drink the water from their tap. And yeah, just simply they're dying. Um, and here in Maine, we are very, very privileged that we live in a state that actually has pretty intact ecosystems and, and really clean water comparatively to a lot of the rest of the world. And so we can't let that slip from our hands. Um, and so, um, you know, what I really want to stress here is that you know, because of this, um, you know, capitalist system that we live in, we're always being, we're always pitting our health and safety um, against our need for jobs. And we need to stop doing that. We cannot poison our water. We cannot kill ourselves and destroy ecosystems because people need jobs and because corporations have to make money. Um, it just simply is, it, it, it's unreal that we even have to be having this conversation about whether or not we should be devastating ecosystems and poisoning water. And so I just really want to speak to you all individually and really, you know, I want to be, it's really hard to put myself out there like this, but I want to be really like clear and honest and direct when I say that if you support, um, you know, strip mining in the state of Maine, you are supporting the, the devastation of ecosystems, the poisoning of water and killing people. People die when their water is poisoned. Um, I think that's all I got to say. Questions? Thank you very much. Now we're to David. Dave Wood. Dave Wood. And Peter Kalen. Then Diane. Then Bill. And then Dennis. And then we'll be going to the lobbyists. Unless there's some. Is there anybody here that we have forgotten? Yeah, we can do that. We'll take about a 10 minute break before we do. We'll take, we'll take about a 10 minute break when we get ready to go to the lobbyists. So we can take a breather. All right. Good afternoon, David. Senator. Savvy Hello, Representative Welch, and members of the committee. One of your jurisdiction is to protect uh, is to protect our natural resources. Protect them is what you're in charge of here. Uh, I got a good idea to solve everybody's problem around here. We have uh, this beautiful land in the Worcester County, the Woolly Pond, the Fish River Chain, Ball Mountain, and all that. Why don't we just purchase the land from Irving and make, make a safe park? Solve everybody's problem. We attract more tourists, be great birding. Okay. Actually, I, I passed the paper up, and I'm not going to read anything from that. I was um, on the internet the other day, and I came across a disturbing uh, article, and it um, was about powerful outside interest in interest at uh, a lobbying all state legislators in this country to weaken environmental rules. So I dug a little deeper into that, and uh, I, some of our legislators are members of this group. It's funded by the Koch brothers and major corporations, and there was a picture on this website and it showed uh, Senator Cushing, Scott Walker, and the CEO of this ALEC, you know all who that is, and this little picture hugging each other. So I hope we're not listening to these people, ALEC. I hope you're listening to the people that are speaking today and, and the main citizens. And the question is, do we really want to allow open pit mining at all in the state with all the environmental disasters? And I can't think of it 
and search for any mines in the U.S. or Canada, metallic mining, that have been successful without pollution. And I've seen some of those. So let's let's uh, let's not get into that. We don't want we're in perpetuity cleaning up mines. It's not worth the risk of destroying our environment. Thank you. David, thank, thank you, David. Questions? No? Then we go to Peter. The other Peter. Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, distinguished to the committee. <coughs> I've been here before. It's not my favorite thing, believe me. I started off today in the dentist chair for four hours. <laughs> I, I submitted my testimony in advance so I wouldn't have to come in here. It's number 17 in your package. Uh, I came here because I think it's really important, and I came here to answer any questions you have. Uh, I have here a book called Water Rock Interactions or Deposits, Environmental Geochemistry. It's a kind of a Bible for the mining industry. I happen to be an author, co-author of the chapter on arsenic geochemistry. Uh, before I came to Maine for the third and final time about eight years ago, <clears throat> I was a uh, professional uh, wetland scientist. I hold a PhD in environmental engineering, did a lot of work with the chemical industry, did a lot of work with the mining industry, heard a lot about Pennsylvania today. I cleaned up a lot of sites in Pennsylvania that suffered from acid mining. <coughs> did a lot of work in New Jersey. Senator used to live right next to one of they my sites. Me, they kicked me out. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, I, uh, I do hold a doctorate in environmental geochemistry, as I mentioned. Uh, open pit sulfide mining is a recipe for disaster in a place like Maine with the climate we have. It's a, it's a technique that's appropriate for places like Arizona, Nevada, where you have inches of rain a year, not feet. If you expose these sulfide min minerals to water and air, you have to do both. You can do one or the other without trouble, but if you do both, uh, you got acid mine drainage. In the case of Bald Mountain, you also have tremendous arsenic. Uh, we heard a lot about it, 3% arsenic content. That's three parts per hundred. The uh, drinking water standard is eight parts per billion. That's a big number different. Uh, does anybody realistically think you can drive big machines up and down without creating dust that's going to go into the lungs of the people driving the machines, go into the lungs of the animals living nearby, uh, go into the streams, the headwaters of the streams? I heard a lot of good ideas today about setting aside some of these streams. Kathy Scott had a great list. Put all those streams on the list of not allowing mining. Uh, the ad valorem tax that uh, Peter Garrett mentioned is a great idea. I think that if you set aside 10% of the profits of the, what's generated by the mine, 5% retained by the state to administer supervision during the happening, 5% is returned back to the company once they clean up the site and it meets all the standards. The existing rules were wisely rejected by the last legislature. I urge you to do the same. I urge you to send it back to DEP for a rewrite. I urge you to ask for strengthening of the requirements for uh, closure, strengthening of the requirements for defining the mining area, strengthening of the requirements uh, in ensuring that the NERPA provisions are provided. I urge you to have a stakeholder group that includes other than mining. This, these rules were written basically by mining lobbyists at the request of uh, uh, nobody wants to mine. They're insufficient. You need a group that contains enough people with enough expertise to solve it. You did that with the shoreland zoning last year. I think that was a big plus. I think that's the, what you should be doing here. Send it back for rewrite with specific directions and I would volunteer to, to help with that and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Representative Duchesne. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Nice to see you again. Uh, if we did everything that you suggest, which is a good possibility we might, um, I could foresee where that would make open pit mining just about impossible to permit. Would you see it as a possibility that tunnel mining of some kind would be possible within a wet state like this, or is that 
likely also to be precluded? Uh, it's more likely to be feasible to be able to be done. Open pit mining, I just don't see uh, being feasible in this kind of state. The geochemistry of Maine is such that we have basically no carbonates, no limestone. Uh, Pennsylvania is coated with that. Pennsylvania is very resistant to mine drainage, but look what happened. Uh, the, the open pit technique is, is I, I don't see how it can be permitted even under the existing rules. But, but uh, tunnel mining, you do have the, the chance to control it. You do have uh, the chance to limit the amount. It, it's more labor intensive. It actually creates more jobs, which the industry doesn't necessarily want to do. They want to create less jobs and more ore. But uh, it, it is potentially feasible. I'm not anti-mining. I use metal. I worked for the industry. You know, it, it can be done, but it's not cheap, it's not easy, and it's not a panacea. Other questions? Representative Martin. Thank you, Thank you very much. I, I think it doesn't really depend on what the value of the war is going to be. It, it does. And what tends to happen in this industry is that when the value of the ore is high, everybody's out there digging as fast as they can. When the value of the ore crashes, <coughs> the LLC disappears. Well, that's, as you are aware, this is one of the reasons why the company, one company left. Right. Because the price, the, the value of the, of yeah. the largest amount of the ore, which uh, simply was not worth the value. And of course, you may remember that what they wanted to do was go in and take the gold and the silver off the top yep. and leave the copper down below until the price changed. Yep. And, and it was one of those things that we and Aroostook objected to and, and, and before DP, and they left town. So I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And that's a common technique. Another technique where if you give them a time limit on closure for 15 years after they stop mining, they don't stop mining. Right. Every year they go out, get a wheelbarrow full, right. take it back, right. test yeah. it. Yeah. And, and I'd be curious, because I don't think anyone has looked at the idea of, of going underground uh, to my knowledge. So it would be yeah. worth uh, taking a look. A it, it tends to be more expensive to do it that way. Right. Uh, but it, it also tends to be safer, although you look at how many underground coal miners uh, just last week right. were rescued. Right. Others haven't been as, uh, you know, the mine, mining is a tough business. You right. know, it's just like commercial fishing. A lot of commercial well, fishermen. C luckily, according to the previous information on that site, it isn't that deep, yeah. and and uh, and it isn't that wide. I mean, it, 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 basically, for what I'm told, as I remember the stuff we had uh, 30 years ago or whatever, it was at roughly the size of a football field. Yeah, two yeah. different companies have looked at it, decided they couldn't do it without creating water pollution. Right, and and so they the were question, right. and the question basically is seeing to take a look if there is a way to do it and a way to to control uh, the water flow. I mean, I say that because. And I need to say this because I think people just don't understand where I'm from, is that my sporting camp operation is five miles away from the site, yeah. uh, and and so I understand, uh, you know, the issue, and and so I do appreciate your comments. And frankly, in terms of of having helpful information today, you've provided some that will be useful for us to work with. Well, I hope so. That's why I came. Representative Tucker. Sir, I missed your name. Peter. K. Peter Callen. K A L L. I N. I believe I'm number 17 on your PDF that Tyler did. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Peter, good seeing you. Thank you. Thanks. Diane? Diane, Bill, and Dennis. And then we're going to take a 10 minute break. Good afternoon, members of the committee, uh, chairs, I should say first. Uh, my name is Diane Messer, and I reside in the town of Liberty. We've had some excellent testimony here today, and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to try to avoid repeating what's already been said. I didn't hear every single one, but uh, I will try to bring up a few points that were either overlooked or not stressed enough. Um, how I feel. I did attend either all or nearly all of the BEP rulemaking uh, sessions and that was extremely informative. Um, I think they failed very clearly. Um, I'm not slinging mud. I am saying I sat there and I listened carefully and I took notes and I heard bias constantly. I only 
thought of one person that seemed quite neutral, that didn't uh, favorably dispose weakening the rules. And I think we need to give some serious consideration because I don't see how we can avoid it going back to the drawing board. Maybe the reconsideration shouldn't be entirely in the hands of the BEP. Perhaps there should be a citizens commission. Maybe we should have some non-industry people, that uh, academics, some experts. We've had some wonderful testimony here today. I think perhaps they should be brought in on this uh, procedure if you have any intention of trying to pass these rules because the way they are now, I don't see how they, they could possibly pass and it's going to be a major overhaul. Do yourselves a favor and get some um, more neutral people who have some academic background who will look at not just what's easiest and best for the mining companies, but put the people of Bain in first consideration. And um, there are a few things that uh, weren't considered. Uh, many people spoke about how abundant our water is. It's a wonderful wet state. Um, that doesn't mean that we overlook the uh, protection of the water. It's, uh, we're facing now, I know all of you are familiar with the uh, extreme extraction problems that we're having with um, Nestle, which is Poland Springs, uh, many other companies. They are quickly buying up all the bottled water companies in the world, one after the other. The CEO, I'm forgetting his name at the moment, of Nestle has stated publicly that water is not a human right that he feels there should be a dollar sign. It's not what we're entitled to for to live um, as we breathe air. And he feels it should all be metered and he and the other companies should uh, be able to control it. Um, the issue of um, cl mine closure. Uh, Definitely not insurance companies. Oh my goodness! Uh, some type of bonding. I'm I'm not a, a financial contract person. Uh, somebody that has that expertise should give this some careful consideration. Uh, I don't see that it's reasonable to give them any more than five years. And there was the danger mentioned of oh, um, if they have to be responsible, then uh, then they have to. Uh, uh, they'll continue to do that one barrel full uh, of mining and just keep it going forever. Summarize yes, I will. Yes. Um, I, I would like to make one more point about uh, why are we uh, always focused on mining more and more and more. I have seen very little effort to do better on recycling and reclamation. I think that needs to be considered in the rules also and the state's policies. And that's not just within Maine, that is uh, countrywide. So uh, I, I will, I'm sorry I don't have written notes, but I am going to follow up and submit. And um, I welcome any of your um, questions or comments. Questions? Thank you. Bill? Then Dennis? And then we we'll break. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Senator uh, Saviello, Representative Welsh, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. My name is Bill Richards. I live in Rangeley. Uh, I've seen uh, Senator Saviello a few times. I'm also president of the Maine Wilderness Guides Organization, and I'm representing them today. Um, the Maine Wilderness Guides Organization is an association of registered Maine guides sporting camp owners and friends founded in 2004 for the express purpose of preserving and conserving Maine's remote wilderness locations. Its members embrace a set of core values committed to sustaining our natural habitat, including fish and wildlife, <coughs> forests and woodlands, mountains, waterways, and coastline. In meeting these co core principles, Muego promotes non-motorized backcountry travel, preservation of native brook trout and salmon species, heritage hunting, and protecting the natural environment wherever necessary. Any effort to diminish the protection of our natural resources is in inherently contrary to Muego's core principles. Muego is extremely concerned that these proposed mining rules may harm our ability to hunt, fish, and support our families through guiding. So it's a, a serious economic concern for us. The environmental damage caused by metallic mining in this country is well documented even with contemporary mining methods. Study after study has shown the degrading impact of metallic mining on land, air, and water. 
Landscape degradation from we uh, waste rock piles and open pits is a common outcome from met metallic mining sites. Mining po uh, pollution also causes the decline of wildlife and plant species. Particulate matter, another common byproduct of metallic mining, can result in air pollution from noxious minerals such as arsenic, cadmium, and lead. Cadmium is all already an issue here in the state of Maine. If you hunt and if you've shot a deer, you leave the live in the woods today. Now, growing up, I'm 70 years old, growing up, never did that. Always took it home to mom. It's not an issue anymore. It's an issue today. These metals, in turn, have, uh, as I indicated, uh, an effect not only on wildlife, but also on humans who come in contact with these elements. Water pollution is probably of most concern, especially here in Maine. The impact of mining wastewater from sulfide deposits can have a devastating effect not only on groundwater, but also Maine's streams, rivers, and ponds. Any consideration of allowing metallic mineral exploration, advanced exploration, and or mining should be closely regulated by environmental impact studies. Conducted by licensed entities, whatever, uh, the, you know, the, the State Department, uh, the DP, whatever it is, permits, permits should only be granted if the environmental impact is determined to be minimal. In addition, any resulting environmental damage that may result from exploration or mining should be the full responsibility of the company or entity conducting the activity. And I think you've heard this several times today. Uh, this would require the company or entity to set aside enough money to cover a worst-case environmental disaster, and that's, for, uh, from our perspective, up front. Given the possible negative impact upon Maine's natural environment, and especially the potential impact of mining on water quality, Muego urges the Environmental and Nat Natural Resources Committee to reject these rules and replace them with rules that will protect Maine's forests, rivers, and streams, and our livelihoods. Thank you for considering this testimony and for carefully examining any provision that may jeopardize the protection of Maine's natural environment. Thank you Questions very much. Questions for Bill? Just a personal note, just if I have maybe a second sure, or two here. Sure. The, the, you know, the reclamation costs of a, of a disaster is a real important issue. And I just strongly encourage you to, you know, to really research that and make absolutely sure that the funds are up front and put away. And you know that that can be extremely, extremely expensive. I don't have to tell you that. So, thank you very much. Questions? Wait. No, I'm sorry. I just did that to make you stop. <laughs> thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Good seeing you. All right, Dennis. And that's it, I think. Get to this list. <laughs> welcome. Bad and cleanup. You Citi are. Betting citizen cleanup, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't tell you how um, sorry I initially was to miss my post-lunch call because I was in, unavoidably detained. But um, I'm actually really glad I did because uh, I got quite an education from what I wouldn't otherwise have heard. So much so that I haven't um, submitted my written testimony because the conclusion has changed. So I'll send it to you less scrawled <laughs> but I'll start out that way and we'll see where we get um, Senator Savio representative Walsh members of the committee so my name is Dennis Chinoy I live in Bangor I'd like uh, to focus as I did last year on one uh, deficiency glaring deficiency in the proposed mining regulations that should lead to their rejection unless rectified no mining regulations will absolutely guarantee the integrity of Maine's waters. Historically, mining projects in the U.S. frequently pollute, despite being approved as in accordance with existing regulations. Here are four salient findings from a study that compared predicted versus actual water quality, looking at 25 in-depth case studies of modern era U.S. mines, and I'll provide the link for that. 64% of the time, in these cases, mitigation measures pre to, uh, predicted to prevent water quality limits failed. 76% of the time, mines violated groundwater or surface water standards, or both. 89% of the mines that specifically predicted there would be no acid drainage did develop acid drainage. 100% of the 19 mines that failed to comply with water quality standards had predicted they would comply with them, which makes sense because they wouldn't have been permitted. But it's a pretty interesting, is it worth mentioning? So given this failure rate, 
uh, up of, of mines elsewhere, it's essential that Maine's approval of mining applications require upfront, in-depth review by experienced third-party evaluators. They need to be recognized experts who are knowledgeable about potential pitfalls that could main, mains, make Maine's waters another sorry case in, mains, in mines gone bad, despite all reassurances. Uh, this is not in the regulations, and um, it should be there. So please think ahead um, to when, for a pertinent example, Aroostook Resources, J.D. Irving's ostensible mining subsidiary, submits its mine, its bid to, to uh, mine Bald Mountain. Aroostook Resources, in fact, is not a mining company at all, has never, mount, <coughs> never mined an ounce of anything. And despite that, this paper corporation will evaluate whether its mining uh, plan complies with the requirements of the mining regulations. To some, that will be as credible as a monkey evaluating a banana. Then the company and perhaps its hired consultant will tell the DEP, don't worry, we'll comply with all the requirements and we'll do it right. So how confident can we be that they'll be right? Since these regulations will apply to any prospective mining site in Maine, how sure can we be that any company or its hired consultants will be right? I don't know. I'd respectfully suggest that you don't know. And um, given the track record of the statistics we've heard, um, there's no special reason to think that the DEP or the BEP will have any better track record than things that have happened elsewhere. Dennis, can you move to smooth yep. a little bit, if you wouldn't yeah. You're um, going to give it to us in writing, too. Which would be I will give it to writing. But uh, the, sort of, so my conclusion was going to be that it really makes sense. There's a, there's a uh, provision in the, in the regulations to get third-party advice, and that's there already. It's going to suggest that it be mandated. But you know, listening to here, all, listening all afternoon to people a lot smarter than I am, um, I'm pretty struck by the, the simple message that was we've heard at the end, which is simply that open pit sulfide mining in the state of Maine will be a disaster. That seems to be the conclusion. I'm persuaded by that. And so my suggestion would be, number one, reject the rules outright. And number two, and here's where I will dabble in legislation for the first time ever, write a statute that says, given the inherent dangers and ineradicable risk to Maine, waters specific to Maine, um, open pit mining should be prohibited in the state of Maine. We would entertain a law like that. If, you, if that was passed, not by this committee, but if it was passed, then uh, you wouldn't have to figure out a lot of ways to tweak rules that such a law would make irrelevant. Thank, Thank you. you. Questions? <laughs> Guys, we're fighting. You're, I should distract, distract it from our break. No, go ahead, represent. Represent Shane. Uh, represent Tucker. You got a question? Your lights are <coughs> first. I just left it on. Oh, okay. We'll let you get by. Representative Duchesne. Thank you. You're sending us a link to the stats you read off earlier. Yes, and, okay. the, refer and the references. Okay, good. Because uh, what my curiosity will be is what's the definition of failure? Uh, because I can think of smokestacks that have an opacity incident and they get uh, notice of violation and it's a very minor failure, but it would still show up in the stats. And I'm trying to just, I'm going to want to judge how bad was the yep. failure we're talking about. Right, right. I'll, say, I'll send you the study, not just the link. Okay, great. Yep. That was my question the source. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> no? If not, then thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to take a 10-minute recess and we'll start promptly at quarter... Oh, 10 minutes to 4. 10 minutes to 4. So I'll even give you a few more minutes. 10 minutes to 4. 3.50.